So we'll go ahead. Um, well, welcome everybody to a joint uh, grand round, a, a Department of Medicine grand round, and a, a Resiliency and Wellbeing Center grand round. We have had these in the past and uh, delighted to continue the collaboration that we've had with the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center um, on this grand round here today. Um, so thank you all for joining. And I would like to introduce Dr. Lee Frame, who is the Resiliency and Wellness Center's Associate Director and Research Director. She's also the Director of the Integrated Medicine Programs and Executive Director of the GW Office of Integrative Medicine and Health, as well as being an Assistant Professor of Clinical Research and Leadership here at uh, GW. And Dr. Frame will introduce our speaker. So Lee, I'll hand the Zoom to you. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, and it is absolutely a delight for me to introduce one of my colleagues at the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center, Victoria Karasheva, MD, MS, NCC, LCPC, SP, LPC, LCA, DAS, and I swear there are more letters coming. She is one of the most well-learned people that I know, um, and I think you will have a, a very um, wonderful experience learning from her today. Uh, her role in the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center, she is the Behavioral Health Director, and she's also an adjunct faculty in the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership. She's been in clinical practice for over two decades and held various leadership and clinical roles in inpatient and outpatient behavioral health and substance abuse treatment settings. She received her MD in the Ukraine, training in psychodynamic psychotherapy and psychoanalysis in Austria, and then came to the United States where she earned her master's degree in counseling from Loyola University. She's been involved in research with Chernobyl catastrophe survivors, war survivors, and has extensively worked with medical students and healthcare professionals to develop interventions to prevent burnout syndrome. She's also developed her private practice and consulting services, Trauma Solutions, Inc., that focuses on trauma treatment through body-mind modalities, including EMDR, biofeedback, and anti-gravity yoga for trauma, as well as a number of other experiential therapies. So without further ado, I am thrilled to turn it over to Dr. Karasheva, Victoria, it's yours. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And I really appreciate you spending your time here with us to learn more about uh, substance use and behavioral patterns and their effect on sleep. I think it's a fascinating topic. I hope we all learn a lot today. I'm really hoping to accomplish a few things here. Um, in addition to just seeing that connection be be between the behaviors, uh, substance use and sleep, I also want us to dive into some common social demographic factors that lead to sleep disturbances and really importance of taking them into consideration when we are approaching our interventions with we are working with patients or, you know, we just want uh, a more successful uh, interventions for ourselves and also look at some behavioral strategies that would help us improve our sleep. Uh, we will touch upon uh, medications and maybe some over-the-counter solutions really briefly, but mostly focus on behavioral strategies here. So why are we talking about sleep and what is it that makes it so special? Because uh, honestly, if you look from the evolutional perspective, uh, during sleep time, uh, human beings and other animals are extremely vulnerable, right? And we are also not reproducing, we are not looking for food, and yet this specific feature is a part of pretty much any living organism for a reason. Uh, if you look at the hierarchy of needs here, uh, sleep along with breathing, food, water, sex is at the very kind of base of our needs. And without it, all other higher items like self-esteem, self-actualization, love, belonging, they just would have a very difficult time happening because we're not taking care of our base. So sleep is amazing. Uh, phenomena. Uh, and there is nothing cuter than sleeping baby or sleeping animals. That's why I have this nice picture here. But sleep does a lot of good things to our bodies and minds. Better mood, feeling happier. There is some research that was done in preschoolers that pointed out that actually those uh, kids that have more sleep or better sleepers, uh, they have more mature and empathic responses comparing to those that don't. And that's also replicated in healthy adults. 
Uh, we are able to cope with stress better. We have increased energy, more focused and alerted. Again, another study in children showed that those that sleep better have a higher IQ scores and better grades. And they also kind of uh, proved it in a twin studies where the twins that sleep better had higher scores on standardized tests. Um, interestingly enough, uh, also in adolescents uh, that are driving, uh, and my daughter is there, she is soon going to get her driver's license, uh, demonstrated a reduction in motor vehicle accidents, and this is 16, 18 year old, by 60, 70 percent when they started, you know, going to school or to whatever other commitments they had. 30 to 60 minutes later, respectively. It's a huge number of reduction in a very simple intervention, right? Uh, also decreased risk for illnesses and health problems. So uh, no wonder we have sleep as our important basic need. So I think the next question that comes is how much sleep we really need, how much is enough? And this is CDC recommendations. And as you see, uh, the younger we are, the obviously the more time we spend sleeping. Uh, the older we are, that time decreases. However, seven to nine hours of sleep is what kind of recommended for uh, 18 to 64 year old adults. Uh, when we cross this threshold of 65, uh, not that it's diminishing, it's uh, not that we need less sleep, it's just the time we spend in non-REM and REM sleep is kind of decreasing a bit. So it's it's important to know and take into consideration when we are working with older adults, um, uh, just to keep it on the radar because sleep issues in elderly is a huge problem, as well as um, um, misuse of sleeping pills. Now let's kind of look at some basic sleep architecture, uh, which is our um, structural organization of sleep. And in front of you is a hypnogram. And here you see uh, different cycles that we go through as we sleep. And uh, roughly we kind of have two major components of sleep. One is non-REM sleep and REM sleep. And uh, they repeat, they go kind of over and over throughout the night. We might fit in five to six cycles like that. Now, what's fascinating about those sleep stages is they, they really serve an important purpose. And I often tell people who are trying to squeeze in, like uh, before the exam, they try to spend a few sleepless nights studying or before an important talk or presentation, they spend a few sleepless nights. I really tell those people that you are robbing yourself of what... Uh, of important functions that are happening in your brain while you're sleeping. And that is memory consolidation, creative manipulation of information and finding perhaps some uh, good solutions to issues that you're struggling with, which happens in REM sleep. Uh, also very important function, which is a removal of metabolic waste via our glymphatic system. Actually, that toxins removal in sleep is responsible for prophylaxis or proper mental health. And that's something that uh, we really need to feel well rested mentally and feel physically. So uh, keep that in mind when you're trying to kind of hit another uh, no sleep night. Uh, and just be mindful that there are important processes that are happening in our brain that is very, very active during the sleep. Another uh, concept that I would like to introduce is circadian rhythm. And this is something everybody probably heard about. Uh, this is our biological clock. So this clock kind of controls the rhythms of our body, both psychological and physiological, uh, that occur approximately 24 hours, right? And this clock is affected by the light exposure and melatonin uh, is produced when it's dark around nine. This is when the melatonin secretion starts. And then when daylight 
starts, it signals to the brain to stop producing melatonin, and that happens around 7.30 in the morning. There are so many other functions that are happening, uh, so we need just to keep in mind as practitioners that we need to work with our body and with our body clock as opposed to against it when we are trying to do certain things. Um, now, sleep disruption. Uh, not good for you. Uh, actually, an uh, interesting fact, uh, in um, 1963, a 17-year-old Randy Gardner set a world record of going 11 days and 25 minutes without sleep. So he's the only you know, one that will be held in the Guinness Book of Records uh, in this category because this category was eliminated due to extreme dangers to our body and to our mind as a result of it. Uh, interestingly, going 24 hours without sleep uh, really compared to having a blood alcohol um, content of 0.1, which signals that this is, you know, kind of uh, impairment uh, similar to intoxication. Uh, so those are kind of effects that we are facing when we are sleep deprived. There are lots of different studies that's been done on effects of sleep disruption. And as you see here on this diagram, there are obviously lots of different things that are happening. I want to highlight a few. Um, on the mental health arena, we see increased level of anxiety and depression. In fact, in shift workers, they're probably one of the highest. Uh, major uh, risk for um, completion of suicide. Um, during the light uh, daylight saving, and we still have it <laughs> twice a year, uh, loss of one hour of sleep unfortunately increases deaths by suicide by 6.25% for a few weeks after spring daylight saving when we are losing an hour of sleep. Um, in addition to that, uh, same daylight saving is also increasing risk of cardiovascular disease and heart attacks, and that increased by 24% uh, the day after losing one hour of sleep. Interestingly enough, when we gain the hour of sleep back, then that percent goes down by 21%. Um, and also, you know, traffic accidents because people are not able to concentrate well. So this is another thing that's happening. Um, sleep deprivation also increases dementia risks. Um, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, you know, very famous people out there. They always prided themselves in working, uh, you know, long hours. I think the average that is recorded for them was four, six hours um, of sleep. And they both, uh, unfortunately, faced an early onset of dementia. So this is something important to keep in mind. Remember, we've talked about the toxic kind of a uh, protein elimination through lymphatic system that's happening in the non-REM sleep. That's what kind of that toxin buildup is believed that probably uh, contributes. Also, you know, sleep disruption has huge effect on um, insulin resistance. That's why we are seeing obesity, uh, type 2 diabetes. So it's something important to keep in mind as we are approaching this topic. Now, I promise I'm going to talk a little bit about social demographic factors and how they impact sleep. Uh, it's really fascinating. And again, I have some uh, citations here in case anyone is wondering, you know, what articles to read or what, what books to read on the topic. So uh, those factors such as race and ethnicity are very strongly associated with sleep disturbances, even during childhood. Uh, so uh, in terms of races, um, what do we see that the sleep architecture and duration of sleep is often better among Caucasian patients than for members of other ethnic and racial groups. Female gender and low social economic status can also account for uh, some rates of uh, um, sleep disturbances, uh, and that also um, varies across different ethnicities. 
lifestyle behaviors such as working night shifts, being physically inactive, consuming diet that's high in fats and energy dense carbohydrates can also impair sleep. And of course, all the substances that we're going to talk about in detail also impact. On this diagram here in front of you, you'll see lots of other factors that are important to take into consideration. Um, I just want to illustrate that um, conversation about how race affects um, sleep and ethnicity. This is a comparison that was run between um, African American and Caucasian women. And you see clearly that some socioeconomic factors um, and demographic factors that are specific to African American women uh, unfortunately compromise their sleep quality. So you'll see a little better sleep quality in Caucasian women than in African American women here. Now let's dive into specifics, substance use and sleep. Now, um, in my practice and in the literature, about 70 to 74 percent of those in treatment for alcohol and other drug use report distress re related to sleep, right? So substances impact pretty much every aspect of sleep. Time it takes to fall asleep, ability to stay asleep, quality of sleep. Uh, they are contributing to development of insomnia, sleep apnea, circadian rhythm disorders, and uh, they also impact when you are at actually getting off those substances, your sleep does not come back right away. It sometimes takes two to three years to gain your normal sleep back. So that's important to keep in mind. But long-term abstinence can reverse those sleep problems. Uh, now, uh, you already probably got that uh, substance use and sleep have kind of a bi-directional relationship. People who suffer from uh, different sorts of uh, Sleep conditions can be at increased risk of substance use because they are trying to kind of uh, use uh, different substances as sleeping aids or use stimulants to increase their energy and compensate for their time fatigue. Uh, it also that insomnia may increase the risk of substance use by impairment of cognition and increased impulsivity. Also, sleep disturbances predict early onset of alcohol and substance use in adolescents. And another interesting information from a study that was done on children, slow wave sleep deficiency may be associated with development of alcohol use disorder, even in children with some family history of alcohol use disorder. So, um, Let's look at some specific substances here, alcohol and sleep. Uh, look at this histogram here. Um, you see that alcohol has a profound effect on uh, sleep architecture. And of course, those effects would depend whether it is acute or chronic use, um, how much you use and so on. But Let's say, you know, a lot of us maybe like to drink a glass of wine or two or a beer or a few before bed. So drinking alcohol before bed can increase the suppression of your REM sleep during the first two cycles. And you see it on this hypnogram. And since this is a sedative, Sleep onset becomes, you know, much shorter for those that drink. So you fall asleep fairly fast, right? And it's a deep sleep. However, alcohol is known to really suck the REM sleep out of you. So you don't really get that. And th this is in balance between the slow wave sleep and REM sleep that uh, becomes a problem and creates fragmented sleep and also decrease overall quality of sleep. Now, some of you may say, wait a minute, uh, I know when I drink, um, you know, I still can see dreams, right? And they could be very vivid dreams. That is true because that REM sleep 
uh, body is trying to fit or crumb into at the very end of the night. So that's why you probably see in vivid dreams and remember them because that's your body's compensation mechanism. Now, people who drink before bed um, obviously wake up in the morning and feel excessively sleepy the following day. So what happens very often, they try to self, you know, uh, to get some caffeine in them, to get the energy boost, right? But then it's very hard to fall asleep. So if we're using alcohol to help us sleep and it becomes a cycle that is very, very hard to break, right? And I already said that, you know, those issues with sleep will um, continue even if you're trying to abstain from alcohol. And uh, this is probably number one thing that people complain about when they are uh, trying to achieve sobriety and it may take a while. Now, I'm focusing on alcohol for a reason. Um, I think during COVID-19, what we've seen, and it still continues to a degree, we've seen an increased amounts of alcohol and um, cannabis use uh, just because those are uh, a little bit more available, right? Uh, so alcohol became a huge problem and there is, uh, you know, a huge amount uh, of people that perhaps were casual users that shifted to abusing it. So uh, it's important to kind of know where your limit lies. That's why I have this uh, picture here uh, that keeps you to put things in perspective. Uh, let's say I'm drinking a glass of wine before bed. All right. Uh, this amount of alcohol would probably decrease my sleep quality by 9.3%. While if I decide to go above two drinks for men and one drink for a woman, that may potentially decrease the quality of my sleep by 39.2%, which is almost 40%. So kind of think about it. And when, when we are talking about what that drink looks like, here is kind of um, a picture to give you an idea. And now binge drinking is a measure thing uh, that you also need to kind of uh, keep your radar on because if we binge drink on a weekly basis, it's really affecting our sleep significantly. And it doesn't matter what our gender is. It doesn't matter how old we are. It just happens, right? Um, so just be mindful of that. And another aspect of alcohol use and uh, sleep apnea, I want to bring to your radar because it's been pretty well researched. And uh, people who drink alcohol have about 25% higher risk of obstructive sleep apnea. And some studies suggest that this is because alcohol contributes to, um, you know, to throat muscles to relax. Uh, and that turns to create more resistance during the breathing. So another substance that also we see, uh, we've seen a lot of during COVID, opioids in sleep. And opioids, what they do, they bind directly to body's mu receptors. And that has a profound effect on a sleep cycle by speeding up a transition between different stages of sleep and making it very difficult to achieve deep sleep, right? So that's why people who use opioids of different kinds, really struggle to get a good night of sleep. And if you see here, you see REM sleep decreases, slow wave sleep decreases, and body is going through this abbreviated sleep cycles, right? So insomnia is unavoidable in those cases. And this is the most common symptoms of opioid withdrawals as well. Um, so when you are trying to achieve abstinence from opioids, uh, those problems may last up to several years. So again, not an easy fix, but something to keep you, keep you aware of. Stimulants and sleep. I have a picture of Sigmund Freud here for a reason. Uh, so phosphor of psychoanalysis really had this uh, 
you know, uh, high, uh, he was a fond of cocaine as a therapeutic modality, and he was a high prescriber. And he probably caused the first episode of stimulant-induced psychosis in uh, one of his patients who was his colleague. So, uh, of course, things had changed uh, since then, and uh, we don't do that. However, those that use stimulants of different kinds, uh, obviously need to be aware that they have a profound effect on sleep cycle because they directly affect uh, dopamine transporters that inhibit elimination of dopamine from synapse. Thus, it increases the quantity and half-life of dopamine. As we know, dopamine influences mood and reward feeling, affects alertness that is tied to the sleep cycle. So when you use stimulants regularly, insomnia, again, is unavoidable, just like with our previous substances discussed. Uh, what cocaine does, it decreases the amount of time that we spend in a deeper low wave sleep. Uh, uh, and then increases the amount of time spent in the lighter stages of non-REM sleep. It also shifts the timing of our REM sleep within the sleep cycle. Uh, so it occurs earlier within the sleep period. Now, someone that comes down from the stimulant use will experience a crash due to the chemical imbalance in the brain that we just discussed. And as that crash occurs, they really lose a sense of energy and excitement that stimulants gave them. So very many, you know, lots of people that use stimulants will be just afraid to get off them because they're experiencing that sluggishness, complete fatigue, loss of sleep, exhaustion. So they, they really don't want to struggle with that calm down. So a lot of times substance use is driven by that, okay, I'm feeling all these feelings that I don't like, so I will continue using um, and that becomes a vicious cycle. Um, since we're talking about uh, stimulants, I want to mention caffeine, which uh, you know a lot of us uh, use in different types uh, and forms. Uh, and again, caffeine is there to help us feel more energetic, alert, help us to wake up for you know for that early shift or stay through the shift when we are you know working at night. Uh, so. It's important to remember that half-life of caffeine is six hours, meaning that if you had your coffee or any other caffeinated drink, even chocolate, sometimes, you know, we uh, compensate. I'm one of those people. Uh, and uh, that stays for six hours in your system. So I had it, let's say, at 2 p.m., six hours later, half of it is still in me, right? So the advice is for your first caffeinated beverage of the day, first of all, wait for two, three hours after you wake up before having your morning coffee. This allows your body cortisol level to even out, can help prevent afternoon fatigue, and then stop drinking your coffee by midday, okay? And again, limit your caffeine to 300 to 400 milligrams a day. And to give you an idea of what it may look like, I have this chart here that has, you know, different types of coffees, tea, soft drinks, et cetera, that contain caffeine. Another stimulant, nicotine, right? Uh, similar effects as caffeine, increases blood pressure and heart rate, uh, helping us to stay more alert and awake. Uh, and consequently, we have a harder time falling asleep and spend less time in our deep and restorative sleep. Uh, that needed to consolidate those memories that help us with emotional regulation, that help us to feel well rested, and so on. So thus, consequently, we have a harder time to get up in the morning, uh, often experience daytime sleepiness and insomnia-like symptoms. So if we have respiratory conditions, that's especially troublesome because it exaggerates them and in turn also cause frequent sleep disturbances. So important to keep in mind. 
Now let's look at cannabis and sleep. This is kind of a hot topic uh, because there are so many different uh, products out there. But uh, just to understand the mechanism and how it all works, cannabis binds to cannabinoid receptors, right? That are part of our endocannabinoid system. And that system plays a role in sleep and sleep neurophysiology. So if you look here, at this hypnogram, what you'll see uh, that uh, marijuana decreases the time that it takes to fall asleep. So you fall asleep much faster, right? It also suppresses REM sleep throughout the night, uh, which also, you know, deprives you of that memory consolidation and creative solutions and emotional regulations and so on. But then what it does, it increases the stage to light sleep through the night. So what happens as a result, we are kind of falling asleep earlier, but then that sleep is not a quality sleep, right? And chronic use of cannabis really lessens uh, this time, and we do build tolerance, and it leads to more use. And again, if you look at how many of our patients are having those issues with insomnia and poor sleep quality and vivid dreams, it's about 32 to 70 percent of patients, right? And those effects can last up to 45 days. Um, which, you know, after you discontinue using, which is also kind of troublesome for those people that are using for the whole reason to fall asleep, right? Now, um, is cannabis really a treatment for insomnia? That conversation has been, you know, going for a while. So while it may improve subjective sleep initially, we need to know that cannabidiol, CBD, is thought to be responsible for the disruption of the circadian rhythm. So uh, CBD may have therapeutic potential for treatment of insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea, but higher doses of it can be stimulating. And uh, those pa the patients would feel that. And actually, one of the very frequent uh, symptoms of uh, withdrawals would be anxiety and insomnia. Uh, many people say, oh, you know, there are no withdrawals from cannabis. That's not true. It's just the symptoms may be not as apparent, but they're definitely present, right? And THC is also accountable for changes in the sleep architecture uh, that may decrease sleep latency and impair sleep quality. Now, nabilon, which is a synthetic cannabinoid, may assist sleep if disruption is caused by PTSD nightmares. So there is a potential day there to be kind of mindful of. And uh, just to sum it all up, uh, if we look at mental health and physical health uh, effects of um, cannabis, both observational and epidemiological literature appears to so associate uh, its use with mental health and physical health risks that may, may not be really may overweight the benefits, right? Uh, one of the mental health things that I want to point out is the problems with the cognitive pruning pruning that affects our brain development. And it's interesting because research has shown that those um, kids that start using uh, marijuana before age 15 uh, have increased risk of um, neurodevelopment problems uh, up to 12% comparing to a general population. So really using any types of uh, cannabis products before age 20, I would say, would not be advised because this uh, pruning is still happening in our brain and, um, you know, uh, cannabis can disrupt that process. Uh, it also affects the course of uh, disease for those that have underlying um, major depression and bipolar condition. Uh, and again, a development of tolerance and addiction. Cannabis use disorder is diagnosed in 22% of those who use cannabis. So kind of be mindful of that. 
Now, if you're looking at the physical health, cardiovascular disease, chronic bronchitis and impaired respiratory function. It's also cancerogenic. Uh, we kind of need to remember that. Uh, and again, uh, if you are using marijuana when, while pregnant, that exposure may be associated with poor outcomes for uh, the baby. So we observe low birth weight, impaired neurodevelopment. So those are the things to be mindful of when you're thinking, okay, should I use, should I not use? And again, if you are using it for medical purposes, always obviously consult your physician. Uh, we have our Center for Integrative Medicine here in GW that can advise you on that, has excellent practitioners. So don't try to... Uh, Play with the dosage yourself. Now, technology and sleep, uh, this is a, a big thing, uh, I think, for all of us, because we spend a lot of time using technology, whether it is for work or entertainment. Uh, so according to the National Sleep Foundation study, 95% of individuals surveyed by them reported using electronics in, in, uh, one hour before they went to sleep. 15% uh, of 19 to 64 year olds get less than six hours of sleep, sleep on weeknights, and some of it is tied to the use of electronics. And 90% of our younger people sleep with the phone right next to the bed, and I have one of those in my household uh, that cannot port with her phone. And, and again, um, if you're looking at the technology and how it affects our sleep, uh, we need to start with a few things. So first of all, bright screen light uh, really increases alertness. It signals our brain to, you know, to continue being alert. Uh, it uh, detrimentally affects production of melatonin. Uh, thus, it's harder for us to fall asleep. It, it is a stimulating activity, right? Uh, so when our brain is stimulated, it does not want to go to sleep. And uh, it also, because there are so many different ways our technology interacts with us, we use it for gaming, for example, for watching movies, you know, that kind of can be addictive and captivating in itself. You become so absorbed in it, right? So you can really continue using that technology be beyond the time you need to go to bed, right? So uh, technology and sleep is definitely something that we need to watch. And interestingly enough, um, it's not just technology itself, it's what is it used for that affects us. And I wanna to touch upon social media because for many of us, you know, we are on different platforms and social media can def definitely change our behavior as it relates to sleep and life as a whole. So there was an interesting study that was done where participants, you know, were surveyed on how social media affect their behavior. And 51% of participants said that it was a negative change that was made. Uh, two thirds of participants reported difficulty relaxing and sleeping after they use different you know, social media sites. And 55% of participants reported feeling worried or uncomfortable when they weren't able to log onto their social media account. Uh, for a lot of young people that, you know, were surveyed, uh, social media and being able to log into their account or check the Snapchat or whatever that is, uh, was a safety issue. They felt safe being able to know what's going on. Interesting, right? Because we've talked about the hierarchy of needs and sleep is right there on the as a base, but the next one is safety. So to see how they are related and how that safety and um, ability to log in kind of overweighted for a lot of young people, their need for sleep.
Now, a social media withdrawal is real. This is the question that I get a lot. So there was a study that was done from our very own University of Maryland, and the students were asked to go without social media for 24 hours. So the study had shown the student had a withdrawal-like symptom, such as anxiety, misery, being jittery. So yes, you can actually experience those withdrawal symptoms, uh, even with the use of technology. Uh, and there's actually right now an um, face Bergen face uh, book addiction scale that can potentially be a tool in measuring uh, how, you know, uh, how severe your addiction to uh, media is. Now, we've talked a lot about substances. We've talked about electronics. Let's talk a little bit about sleep disturbing behaviors. And we kind of all know or have an idea about what they are, but I think that would be a good summary to condense them all in one place. Um, and some of the most common ones is working until bedtime, which I'm guilty of, doing other activities other than sleep in the bedroom. It's working, eating, watching TV. So uh, using bedroom for purposes that are not sleep and not intimacy, right? Uh, using screen in bed, and that's something that we've talked about. Sleeping in an unrestful environment. So uh, restful sleeping environments are typically quiet, cool, and dark, right? So if your environment has kind of extremes of so it's too cold or too hot, or, you know, there is a light, maybe you're sleeping with TV, uh, there are noises that all can kind of uh, impact your sleep. Exercising vigorously within one hour of bedtime. I want to point that one out because I have a lot of people that... I work with that like to hit the gym uh, evening time. And a lot of people do it because, you know, you work and, you know, you do it uh, in the evening just because uh, that's your time to distress, relax, and that's your little escape. It's all good, but um, what it does, it affects our core body temperature. It's not even your sympathetic nervous system that gets stimulated because that goes down fairly quickly. It's really your core body temperature that takes a while to go down and you need a lower core body temperature to fall asleep. So when you exercise close enough to your bedtime, uh, contrary to the common belief that it will make you tired, it actually raises your body temp core body temperature and makes your body still, you know, think that, you know, it's active, it's stimulated and still going strong. Um, other behavior, food and drink, drinking alcohol within two hours bedtime. We've talked about effects of alcohol, drinking too many fluids, right? That causes you to get up in the middle of the night, that's kind of obvious. Eating a large meal before bedtime or indulging in a midnight snack. So all of these things kind of tell your body that we are active, we are searching for food. Uh, again, from the evolutionary perspective, uh, when, when people or animals uh, are hungry, they are searching for food, right? So, uh, and they're searching for food that is feeling them, uh, and that affects the sleep. It also, when we are sleep deprived, our body and our mind is thinking, okay, uh, this is the time for us to search for food. And because we are not in the world anymore where we need to hunt for our food, we can just go to our fridge and grab what we want or go to the store. It becomes a very easy solution. So that behaviorally disrupt um, your sleep-wake cycle. Uh, varying your bedtime by more than an hour across the week, taking naps that are longer than 20 minutes. Um, and again, um, napping is kind of a thing where, you know, unless you are a shift worker, that's definitely not advised. Uh, and again, if you're taking those naps uh, less than three hours before bedtime, it would be very difficult to fall asleep. Um, we've been going strong for about 45 minutes now. So I want to hear from you. And I see people are, you know, putting things in the chat. 
please share some of your experiences in how you personally deal with sleep problems. What are some strategies that were helpful for you in getting a good of, night of sleep? I would love to know about them because in our last section, we're going to dive into, okay, well, how do we improve our sleep? What do we do? And interestingly enough, uh, between non-pharmacological and pharmacological interventions, the preferred treatment of choice for insomnia is something that is called uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI, All right? So it's a combination of different techniques that involve sleep restriction, relaxation training, sleep education, and it can be delivered by various modality from in-person to online to self-guided. Now, if it pairs up with pharmacological therapy, it may produce faster improvement in sleep than just CBTI alone, but there are obviously some side effects that you would experience if you are uh, doing pharmacological interventions and they should be carefully crafted. And if you look at this chart, and I'm not going to stay here for long, that kind of gives you pros and cons of both. Now, in terms of pharmacological interventions, benzos and Z drugs um, is, is something that, again, we need to outweigh benefits and risks. And uh, what we know from the literature and, um, you know, clinical practice is uh, benzos and Z drugs diminish efficacy in as little as four weeks due to building up a tolerance, right? So there is a recommendation to really not to use them for more than four weeks in adults and elderly. And really, it's not advised to use benzos and any sedative hypnotics in older adults as a first choice for insomnia. And there is a huge percentage of, you know, addiction among elderly population to sleeping pills. Right. And it also produces a, lo a lot of risk, uh, daytime sedation, cognitive impairment, rebound insomnia, risk for falls, motor vehicle accidents, the list kind of goes on and on. So there are also some non-prescription and over-the-counter products that are commonly used for insomnia. And I, I give you kind of a, a rough uh, table here, but they they show low efficacy and or low quality evidence for their use, especially in the, if you look at the long term and the safety of doing so. Uh, valerian root is very popular in my country where I come from. Uh, my mom is a big fan of that. I'm going to touch on melatonin because a lot of people are using it. And uh, one thing about melatonin that we need to kind of be mindful of, that I think a lot of us use it incorrectly. Uh, while it's, uh, you know, fairly safe uh, to use and there is no tolerance per se that we know about, some people either use too much or if they don't see an effect, they start using too much later on. While one to three milligrams is probably what's enough. Uh, effect of it is not huge. It probably improves your sleep about 5%. But a lot of people would use it incorrectly. So they, will, they would use it maybe an hour before they go to bed and then they get on the phones or watching TV. And even if you have like blue light filters, there is still, your brain is just still stimulated. Your brain is still thinking we are awake and alert. So it kind of dissolves the effect of melatonin pretty fast. So the advice is don't use more than one to three milligrams. Use it, you know, short enough before you go to bed and don't use electronics or TV. Once you took your dose, just, you know, uh, shut everything down, all the electronics, all stimulating activities and just uh, go to bed. Now, I want to touch upon CBTI a little bit more because, like I said, we're going to be talking about behavioral interventions. And I want you to know that though it's great to have a professional who is a CBTI credential and can work with you or be a part of a CBTI group, there are tons of self-help resources out there that you can tap into your, on your own. Some of them are free. Some of them come with the price tag. 
different quality. So I have a list of them here if you're curious to explore some of them. CBTI Coach is a free one. You can download it, you know, uh, on your iPhone or Google phone. Uh, there are some that have a fairly low cost. Uh, so uh, check them out and see if any of it could be helpful. A vital part of CBTI is sleep hygiene, and we kind of talked about those strategies already. This table just gives you what you should do and what you should avoid as a condensed summary. I want to touch upon one thing that's very important, especially for those of you that are doing shift work. Because like I mentioned, this is a risk factor for so many different things, including insomnia, anxiety, depression. So uh, what there are some things that we recommend when you're doing shift work, eating before shift and halfway through the shift, uh, just to maintain your energy. Napping before the shift, this is something that actually, you know, could help you to get through it. Keep your body moving and stretching and hydrating when you are on shift. Uh, because your uh, kind of a sleep-wake cycle is reverse when you are on the night shift, uh, you're trying to do things to maintain it during the night and kind of in reverse, you're trying to give your body rest after you're off the shift. So to keep yourself being functional, those things are important. Limit caffeine. Um, consider maybe other things, and there are lots of uh, different teas that are non-caffeinated, but have the stimulating effect, like maybe having a ginger and turmeric tea. Um, my younger daughter is now working at the tea uh, place that has a wide variety of um, teas, and she is now an expert of what teas are helping with what, so... I am becoming a big fan too. Uh, now, when you come home, blackout curtains is something important because again, remember we've talked about light and the dark and how they influence melatonin production. So that helps your body to shut down. And yes, melatonin can be considered because you know uh, this circadian rhythm shift is a lot on your body and takes a big toll. So melatonin could be helpful. In terms of other behavioral strategies, one of them is really looking at your mindset because many of us tend to under-evaluate sleep and trade it away for a few hours of being awake. Um, there is a phenomenon that is called revenge bedtime procrastination, and I am guilty of this. This is when you don't have much control over your daytime. You working intense job and you're you know all in it maybe long hours then then you're trying to compensate for it after you're trying to regain some sense of control and freedom and you stay up later to catch up on life because you feel the life is passing you by so that's a dangerous kind of territory uh so think about uh sleep really being a nature soft nurse like Shakespeare said uh, sleep is something that helps your body and mind to detoxify to regain kind of a composure to structure information to process things you are not able to process so treat it as a basic need and treat it with really reverence uh, bedtime routine is crucial do the same things before going to bed each night and go to bed and get up at the same time each day. This is something important. Sleep restriction. This is one of the things that CBTI recommends. This is really not about restricting sleep time. It's about a restricting time you spend in bed. Right. So it's really designed to eliminate prolonged middle of the night awakening. So if you went to bed at 10, woke up at eight, but slept on this six hours, then you should match six hours in bed. That helps your body to kind of make that shift and prevent you waking up um, in the middle of the night. Stimulus control, again, using bedroom for sleeping and intimacy and relaxation. This is relaxation techniques, progressive muscle relaxation, breathing, uh, warm baths or shower, adding lavender to it is always a treat. 
Um, another strategy is sleep journaling. And I have an example of it here. So if you start tracking and logging, how much time did you sleep? What was the quality of sleep? And some sleep disturbing activities. And then after that, you can make an action plan. You can review your journal. You can select up to three sleep disturbing activities that you want to focus on and choose a corrective action, okay? And be very specific on how that's gonna look, okay? Uh, so I have some of those strategies here. Uh, for example, uh, I use the screen in bed and immediately before bedtime. Maybe it's time for me to shift from electronics to a hard copies of something that I can read. Uh, maybe I should store laptop and cell phone in an Azure room. Uh, so I don't have easy access to it. Or maybe I ate a large meal before bedtime, then maybe it's time for me and my family to arrange uh, a different dinner time and be done by a certain time. Here is example 7.38, right? Or trying to eat a larger meal, so breakfast and lunch, and then keep dinner meal smaller. And another thing that is very interesting, it's a dopamine fasting. And that's an emerging trend. Uh, some people say it's too simplistic, but for some, it could be a solution. Uh, because over time, this chronic exposure to different pleasurable stimuli that we have in abundance like right now, our receptors kind of downregulate and shrink. And our hedonic set point or baseline happiness level drops. So we need more of our favorite stimuli to feel as good as we did before. So what's recommended to reset the brain's reward circuit is a four weeks fast from your drug of choice, whatever that is, media, video games, porn, junk food, alcohol, you name it, and see what happens. And with that said, I think we have a few minutes left. I'm going to pause and thank you for bearing with me for this long hour. And I'll be happy to answer questions and happy to stay for a few extra minutes because I know I took more time. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this was really outstanding. And I think um, this, this relates uh, obviously not so much or it, very much to our patients, but I think all, to all of us as well as is the the goal of the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. So we appreciate the partnership. There are a bunch of great questions in the chat, many of which you addressed along the way, but I wanted to um, just highlight a couple before we close. Um, Dr. Onima asked, any role for light therapy in workrooms for night shift workers? Yeah, light therapy has been kind of a uh, a, a trendy thing right uh, out there. Uh, like I said, uh, in terms of our melatonin production and how light regulates it, we need to be mindful that if we are using the blue light uh, filters, that obviously can help if we are using, if we are just exposed to the light uh, without them, that definitely has more impact on us and in the melatonin production. So kind of seeing that circadian clock that I showed earlier and like the timing of the production and how things shift uh, when we are working the night shift can be a helpful tool. Great, thank you. And uh, Dr. Collins, one of our nephrologists asked about insomnia and chronic kidney disease where many patients have melatonin deficiency um, and then uh, exaggerated effects of benzodiazepines. So any thoughts on patients with chronic kidney disease? Um, I may not be an expert on that specific topic, uh, but there is definitely a correlation as, uh, you know, it, as was mentioned, but I, I may not be an expert to answer that question. Great. And I guess I have just one last question and then we'll wrap up, but I was very, you know, curious about this correlation between um, you know, uh, sleep deprivation and dementia um, later in life and that cleaning function. Um, are there any thoughts on therapeutics other than just improving sleep quality and quantity over a lifetime? So again, we've talked about uh, sleep, uh, behavioral sleep techniques being kind of the first resource 
for us to use. Uh, so starting with that, especially in elderly population, especially with all of the risks that are associated uh, with, you know, uh, benzodiazepines or other Z drugs would probably be a wise place to start and see how it progresses. I would say having a family member of that person to be involved would be helpful because very often there is a caretaker uh, or there are other family kind of system influences that may be empowering or detrimental. So I'm a big proponent of make sure you work with a family unit if you're trying to instill some new habits in your patients and see if you can get their support. Right. Or even for patients with, say, early dementia and slowing progression. Is that the thought? I mean, again, depending on how far you are in this process, uh, but uh, there, there is a lot of research out there that shows that even with the early dementia, there is some promising positive outcomes with using those behavioral techniques. Um, especially, again, that time that person spends in bed um, and versus spending in bed sleeping versus non-sleeping could could be one of the techniques that is used. Great. Well, really wonderful talk. So thank you so much. And thank you as well to Dr. Frame for the partnership and your partnership in the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. Um, a fantastic talk. And uh, thank you both. Thank you all for joining. And we will conclude. Have a good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us.